Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special edition of the U.S. Chamber Foundation's Path Forward series. If you've been a regular viewer, welcome back. If you're new to the series, thank you for joining us. We hope you find it both informative and interesting. And boy, did you pick a great week to tune in. Over the past few months, we've been bringing together experts in a number of critical fields all around the topic of returning to work. Today, we're thrilled to be joined by two of the most impactful philanthropists in the world. Bill and Melinda Gates have dedicated their lives to advancing science and improving public health, among other initiatives. The U.S. Chamber Foundation has a deep relationship with the Gates Foundation. For more than a decade, we've worked together on both K-12 and post-secondary education reforms. We value their partnership, and we're very pleased to have Bill and Melinda Gates with us here today. As you've likely seen a few years ago, Bill brought attention to the risks of a deadly global pandemic. Sadly, his warning is now our reality. The good news is that he and Melinda have committed themselves and their organization to finding a solution, and that gives us all a sense of hope. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has committed more than $300 million to the global COVID-19 response. We're so grateful for their leadership during this trying moment and excited to talk to them today. This episode was pre-recorded to fit their busy schedules, so there won't be audience questions at the end this time. But there's a lot that we get to talk about, and so let's get to it. Well, thank you very much for being with us. We have so many questions, we just want to jump right in. And so let me ask you both. What is the Gates Foundation doing to fight the coronavirus and, and why is it such a priority for you? Well, our foundation uh, has a big focus on infectious diseases that you know kill uh, millions of people, primarily in developing countries. And so you know our understanding about how you design a vaccine, we funded lots of new vaccines. Uh, we're a partner in Gavi, which actually buys vaccines for, uh, developing countries. And we have a lot of the expertise that's not in the private sector to pick which of these we should build factories for and how we coordinate all this activity. And so it's become a huge uh, focus for us. And of course, the benefit of getting the vaccine, you know, even three or four months earlier uh, will be very dramatic in terms of uh, ending these awful economic effects as well as the uh, death and disease. Melinda, when do you think we'll see a vaccine at scale? And, and, and a two-part question, because you've also talked um, beautifully about the need to have an equitable distribution of a vaccine. So kind of when do you see this at scale and what can we do to make distribution equitable? Yeah, so I think we all believe that just seeing the various vaccine candidates that are coming through the pipeline, there are three that are looking quite promising, luckily. And I think we all believe that by 2021, we will have a vaccine. Um, we're working ahead of time with the, as, with the manufacturers, with the pharmaceutical companies to try and actually have manufacturing capability ready to go. So as soon as those trials are finished, the vaccine can go immediately into the manufacturing. And the whole reason we got involved in this vaccine was to make sure there's equitable distribution. The last thing you want is a bidding war between countries for this vaccine. You know, we know there are 60 million healthcare workers around the world who are keeping everybody safe. They deserve to get this vaccine first. And from there, you want to do tiering in various countries to make sure your most vulnerable populations get it. Uh, in, in our country, that would be Blacks and Native Americans, people with underlying health conditions, and the elderly. And so we need to look at as a globe, and we're involved with many European leaders um, and African leaders and others in Southeast Asia to make sure there's a purchasing fund that can pull that vaccine through when it's available and get it out in wide scale distribution. Gosh, I have so many follow-up questions. I'll try to stay focused. So um, let me go back to Bill for a second. You got widespread attention for a prediction you made in 2015 about the dangers of a global pandemic. And you, sadly for the world, did predict the future. And so let me ask you to do it again. You know, what are you concerned about now? Well, this won't be the last pandemic that we face. You know, pandemics can come from uh, natural causes. Uh, which is largely coming across from other species. 
you know, a flu, for example, uh, is still a very big risk. And so we'll have to invest in making sure that we catch the disease sooner and that we have platforms to make diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines very quickly. Very little was invested, even though there were these calls by uh, a lot of people, including our foundation. Uh, one group that was funded, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, CEPI, CEPI, uh, we, Welcome Trust, Norway, UK, Japan, were the initial funders, and that is helping out here. Uh, so we're better off than if that hadn't happened. Uh, but, you know, people trust government to think through these eventual bad things. Uh, this was a, a failure uh, to, to get ready, and the cost would have been tiny compared to, say, what we spend on uh, being ready for war. We didn't actually do the simulation to think about, okay, what about nursing homes? What about getting factories ready? What about the testing regime? You know, in fact, the testing could have been ramped up uh, very quickly. And a few countries that have almost avoided the epidemic entirely, like uh, Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, you know, they took their experience and actually prepared. And so they moved a lot faster. Uh, so we, you know, we'll have to prepare for the next one. That, you know, I'd say is, uh, will get attention this time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that reminds me of going back to the vaccine, Melinda, and I promised to move off of it, but, you know, we've never had a vaccine for a coronavirus and that makes people nervous about this time. So I think the audience will be so pleased to hear your optimism for this, right? But what do you think is different this time that makes us think the development will happen? Is it this global coordination? It's this, it's the pharmaceutical companies working together with scientists from all over the globe um, in a very coordinated fashion. We have never seen uh, the companies come together in this way and also to be thinking ahead about manufacturing and manufacturing not just for their own country or their own region but for other places in the world and so that's what makes us optimistic is the many many conversations that we're having uh the way we're seeing the scientists move forward with the data as soon as they get it um, and also seeing global leaders come together like the european commission did a huge pledging event for this vaccine alliance that we've been part of and seeing money come together to say we need this so that it's ready when the vaccine's ready to go. We can actually purchase the, that vaccine for the rest of the world. And do you think, uh, Bill, the same thing is true on therapeutics and testing? I mean, do you think that the way that things are coming together will get us where we need to be on the other sides of the equation as well? Well, people are caught a little bit flat footed in that usually the US is very well organized. Uh, so the you know, this new drug that got proven out, that's a, a trial network we funded with others with Wellcome Trust in the UK. Uh, you know, usually you expect the US to do good coordinated trials and, you know, to pick drugs for their scientific merit. Uh, the world has had a little bit of a hard time when the, the US testing thing uh, went in the wrong direction. Uh, when it hasn't been a you know a federal notion of how you prioritize things, but I have to say the Europeans are are filling that vacuum, particularly in terms of caring for the entire world. Their generosity has been uh, quite good. Uh, you know, people hope that the U.S. comes back, uh, although you know withdrawing from WHO is is a step in the opposite direction. But historically, the U.S. you know we did smallpox eradication. Rotary's been behind uh, uh, the polio progress that we've made, which is done through uh, WHO and, you know, a substantial part of the U.S. money is uh, that goes there is for that polio eradication. And so, you know, there's still a chance for the U.S. to contribute uh, on this and, you know, not just thinking of itself, but also uh, in the same way we did and particularly President Bush and Pepfar did, uh, helping out the entire world. You know, you've both been really vocal about the need to make this a global response and to help people outside of our 
borders. If you were talking to in this audience, a small business person in, a, in the middle of the country somewhere who might not understand that. Explain why you think it's so important that we reach beyond our borders and help control this virus. Well, I think, you know, COVID anywhere is COVID everywhere. And so for a small business owner, you know, the supplies that come in that help you run your business don't all necessarily come from the United States. And your customers probably aren't all just U.S. customers. And so if we want to have global trade and a global supply chain and global manufacturing, we have to get the whole world coordinated in its response to this disease because it's not going to be able to be contained in one or two places, even once we've gotten it outside of the U.S. borders. Yeah, and to put it in perspective, the U.S. has spent trillions of dollars to try and deal with the problem here. We're only talking about you know less than a few percent that of that that would need to be spent on uh, helping get rid of the disease in the entire world. So it's not like there's some gigantic trade-off. You know these are very small dollars. Just like you know the WHO is 500 million a year. You know for things like reproductive health, vaccines, polio covers a, a lot of different areas. And so it's not competing budget-wise with the large scale resources. You know, your foundation does amazing work. We've been lucky to be partners for a long time on some K through 12 education work. We're very grateful to receive that support and amplify that good work. And it makes me wonder about how the world is changing in a broader sense as a result of this virus. I mean, what do you, I mean, Melinda, let me go to you first. What do you think we're gonna see in terms of some lasting changes as a result of this health and economic crisis? Well, I think that's yet to come. And I think, you know, it's up to us as citizens to rebuild the world that we want. I think this crisis has exposed some of the gaps around the world, but particularly in the United States. And one of those in particular are the gender and the racial inequities that exist. In terms of gender, you know, we know that women do two and a half times more work at home than men do. And um, that's the unpaid labor of caring for the kids, making the lunch, making sure they're online learning right now. And so, you know, it will expose for us that it is just way past time that the U.S. has a paid family medical leave policy. We're the only industrialized nation that doesn't. And if we want to put people back to work safely and keep their families safe from, and from getting sick, we need to have paid family medical leave. And so I think Congress in its wisdom and two of the stimulus bills started to address that. We need a long-term solution. The other thing I would say is not only has COVID exposed the gaps in the system, it's also showed us opportunities. Like the fact that kids could jump online and start learning. Now, unfortunately, it's not all kids because many kids didn't have access to a computer or good digital literacy online or teachers who knew how to teach online, but we know now it's possible. And so I think now we will make sure that technology gets spread equitably and those great lesson plans and advising that can happen. I think one last example I'll give on digital in the developing world, there are many, many people who have phones and do digital banking on their phone. They have access to money on their phone, mobile money. That was at scale in a number of countries, but all of a sudden people really said, oh my gosh, to not have to stand in line for my government payment where I might get sick. So just to take Pakistan alone, in 48 hours, 40 million additional people signed up for a digital bank account. That is an opportunity we can use and particularly use to reach low income families and women on that phone with all kinds of things like cash transfers, more information, more information about when health services are available. So those, some of those digital opportunities are really hitting in ways we didn't expect as quickly as we had, had been had thought they would. I love that answer because I think there's a lot we're afraid of right now, both in terms of health and the economy and how to right this social injustice ship. And there's a lot we're afraid of. And it's nice to think about some optimistic you know, outcomes for this too. So the other day uh, in an interview, David Rubenstein asked me what I had learned about working remotely. Uh, and I admitted to him that 
I was conducting a lot of interviews without shoes on. I'm pleading the fifth about my shoeless state at the moment, but what have you learned about yourselves in this time and, and, and what has changed about the way that you're working? Well, it's impressive that for office work, it, you know, partly building on the relationships that you built up over time, you can actually do quite well. You know, our foundation hasn't, uh, nobody's been in the office, you know, for over three months now, and yet our work uh, is going on pretty much full speed. And, you know, because I'm involved with software, I think, okay, we can make these software platforms even better. Uh, you know, make it easy to take notes or share things or have side conversations. But it, it's been decent enough to allow a lot to happen. And it's certainly going to accelerate the idea of do we need to travel as much? You know, how good can we make online education? How good can we make telemedicine? Uh, it, it, you know, it's like 10 years of progress on those things will get compressed down into just a couple of years. Yeah, I, our, I would say our lives, you know, like everybody around the United States, have changed substantially. Um, we're incredibly fortunate not to be struggling to put a meal on the table. We just are lucky. Um, but yes, our work lives, you know, working from home was not something we did as much before. Uh, we're certainly using a lot of Microsoft Teams and Zoom and other things. Um, like you, Suzanne, I have changed. I've claimed that when I go back to work, I will not be wearing heels. I am going to wear my tennis shoes because I wear them all the time now for every single meeting, including right now. Um, <laughs> and the other thing I would say is I'm not going to travel as much. I think there will absolutely be meetings I travel for and you know, I still think there will be absolutely reasons to go to Africa and Southeast Asia. But I think conferences can be changed and we're seeing many, many people do them online now. And so I do think I will travel less, which I think will give me more time to just enjoy life and take the breaks that I take here in Seattle between my Zoom meetings uh, to step outside a little bit more. Well, I don't know that the world can take you guys taking too much time off. I think we need your hard work and big hearts for the problems that we're facing. And you're really kind to have spent this time with us this evening. So thank you both very, very much. Thanks, Thank Suzanne. you. Thanks for having us. That's great.